want you to go back to work tomorrow and be a Christian on your job. Serving with excellence, serving the Lord, but knowing the Lord knows where you're sitting. He knows how long he wants you there. He knows when it's time to move and he knows the bills that you have to pay and says he is your source and everything else is your resource. God's promotion. A promotion is when you are lifted from one level to another level. Many of you know what it is to be promoted in your job or to be promoted in your experience or to be promoted from the, from the JV to the varsity team to go through things that lift you to a higher level. In our Story today from Daniel chapter 3. A promotion is going to take place. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, they are going to experience a promotion. But it will not come without a trial. They're going to encounter God in a bad situation. Now some of the things I am going to say from this passage will not feel right and will not be comfortable. But that's okay because the more uncomfortable it is, the better possibility for a divine encounter. Let's start with the backdrop of the story. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego find themselves working in a secular culture. They're in Babylon. Babylon is an evil pagan and idolatrous country. Because of Israel's sin, God told Babylon to invade Israel and they brought out many of the young people back into Babylon to live and to work. Daniel, along with the three Hebrew boys, are part of the group that was brought from Israel to Babylon and now they have to live their life and do their work in a non-Christian environment. Many of you tomorrow will go and the people you work with do not share your Christian worldview. They do not believe what you believe. They do not act like you act. They do not walk like you walk. They do not talk like you talk. But that's the world you live in because you have to provide for yourself, for your family, and you will find yourself in an unrighteous environment. That was the three Hebrew boys. They found themselves working for the federal government because they were administrators in the regime of Nebuchadnezzar, who was the governing head of Babylon. So they were government employees working for a pagan government. They were sent to a Babylonian school it says in chapter 1. It says that they were indoctrinated with Babylonian thinking. It says they were even given a Babylonian name after the name of a Babylonian god. So the culture was trying to de-Israelize them and pro-Babylonize them. Trying to take their mindset from the ring of their faith to the raising of the culture. And so you and I, like the three Hebrew boys, are caught in a cultural tension. How we were raised and what we're taught to believe and where we have to live and earn our money. Where we have to live and function and or the people we have to be around because that's the nature of the job in which we're situated. How do you be Christian when <laughs> the environment you're in doesn't support your Christianity? When the environment that you're in is trying to woo you away from your faith, as colleges do with you and me and, and our children, and as the society does with people of God. So that's the situation, that's the circumstance that they find themselves in. Well, something happens in the beginning of the chapter, chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar the head of Babylon develops a theo-ego. Theo is God. 
ego is, is your mindset. He, he developed a, a God mentality. He deified himself. It goes on to say in the first nine verses, you'll see seven times discussion about this image he built to himself. He builds a statue to honor him, 90 feet tall and nine feet wide. He not only builds a statue, he comes up with a law. The law says that everybody is supposed to bow to the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. He calls all of his leaders together and he says, I want you to all to and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Okay, watch this. Now, the issue falls around one thing. Who you going to worship? It says he built a statue and he says you are to worship before the statue. At the heart of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is this issue of idolatry. Let me, for those who may not remember the definition of an idol, an idol is any noun, person, place, thing, or thought that becomes your source. So any person, place, thing, or thought that becomes your source has now become your God. Anything that competes with the God of the Bible as the thing you ultimately look to as your source is your God, rather, no matter whether you call it your God or not. You and I live in a culture that not only wants our work, they want our worship. Because they often ask us to compromise biblical values in order to be accepted or in order to be promoted. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego found themselves in a dilemma. And their career was on the line. While all of this is taking place, racism reared its ugly head. A racial dilemma takes place because verse 8 says, For this reason at that time certain Chaldeans came forth and brought charges against the Jews. So some Babylonians brought charges against the Jews. They didn't like the Jews. They didn't want the Jews working at the company. And the reason they didn't like the Jews is one, they were Jewish, and two, they brought their faith to work. See, they knew they were followers of God. So let me ask you a question. If you were accused of being a Christian on your job, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Or would you be found innocent of all charges? Because your faith is very vague. You know it, but nobody else does. They were clearly followers of God, and they were Jewish. They could not condemn them because of their work, so they had to condemn them because of their faith. So these three Hebrew boys find themselves on a, on a dilemma because now the Babylonians who work with them, their co-workers, come and say and play politics. You know how politics is in the office. They come and play politics. They said, oh, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, you got these Jewish guys here and they won't bow. Oh, then they come to work, they do their job, but you told them to bow to the company. And they're not bowing to the company. They're not, some minority group would not bow. He said, bring them here. Verse 13, bring me, Shadrach, and Abednego here. And in verses 14 and 15, he says, I'm going to give you all another chance. And then he asks the question. If you don't bow, verse 15, if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? Now that's the question. The question is, I'm so powerful. This company is so strong. This government is so much in control. That if I fire you, you will be fired. And you don't know anybody who can overrule my decision. Because I'm the man. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego responded to the king. Okay, say, I don't know if you caught that. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego responded to the king. So they either all talked at the same time or one talked for all three because it says all three responded. That's why you need to hook up with some other Christians in your company so that you're not standing there alone. Okay? 
So they responded to the king respectfully. We do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. Let us answer you. If so be, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. You are to look at your occupation as service to the Lord through the vehicle of that company. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. So they say, we may work for you, but we serve the Lord. The God who we serve is able. The God who we serve, because that's what got them in trouble in the first place. Their co-workers knew that they served the Lord in their job description. But most Christians, many Christians, divorce their everyday work from their service of God. And these three boys didn't. But because we serve him, the God who we serve is able to deliver us. But let's hear the rest of the story. Even if he does not. Because there are two things you need to know about God. He's powerful, so he's able. But he's sovereign, so he can choose. In other words, you never let God's omnipotence, his power, cancel out his sovereignty. God must have the option in any situation to choose what the right thing is to do at that moment. And sometimes he does not he doesn't, then you're going to be mad at him when he doesn't, because somebody told you from the pulpit, he's able. So you got to keep both in tension. And about both, you must say the same thing because they say, even if he does not, let it be known to you, okay. We respect you. We're going to work for you. We are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. As it says in verse 19, then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath. Filled with wrath. And his facial expression was altered. Okay? It's written all over your face. You don't have to say a word. You know, it's just, it's just, it's just he's contorted. He's contorted. Who do you think you talk into? I'm kidding that you said it respectfully. Do you know who I am? Guess what he does? He is so hot, no pun intended. He is so hot. He gave orders in verse 18 to heat the furnace seven times more than it was already heated. We're talking about crispy here. Now let's, let's look at this. Seven is the number completion. This is like your boss saying to you, look, if you don't do this, not only will I fire you, I will see that you never work in this kind of business ever again. Because I'm going to tell everybody else who you are and what you do. And, and we gonna, I'm going I'm to get the word out. I'm the man. You're talking about you not going to bow because you got some other spiritual commitment. So the men who brought them to the furnace, the furnace was so hot, it burned them up. I was, the men who brought them got burned up. That's how hot it was. They tied him up in verse 23 and threw him into the midst of the furnace, still tied up. So they tied up their hands, tied up their feet, and threw him in. God didn't deliver them from the furnace. He let them get fired. But something happens. Verse 24, then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded and he stood up in haste. He said to his high officials, was it not three men we cast bound into the midst of the fire? Come on now, help me with my math. Wasn't it one, two, three, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego? They replied to the king, well, certainly king, we put three guys in there. He said, well, come here, come here. Look through this glass. Loosed and walking around in the midst of the fire without harm and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. You can see that. This is, you, you can preach right here. He says, uh, we put in three, right? Yeah, we put in three. Well, how come? And, and we tied them up, right? Yeah, we tied them up, okay. Well, why am I seeing four? 
So, so if we put in three, why four? And how they walking around when we tied them up and no crispy? No, nobody burnt, nobody. Okay, watch this. Sometimes when God wants to give you an encounter with him, sometimes he takes you out of it. Sometimes he delivers you from it. Sometimes you don't have to worry about it. But sometimes he wants to take you through it or join you in it, not deliver you from it. Sometimes he wants you to see what it's like when you're in the fire and not being burned by the fire. You're in the bad situation at work and he's working right beside you. He says, I see four and the fourth one I see looks like somebody straight from heaven. Sometimes heaven wants to join you in a bad situation without taking you out of it. He just gonna join you in it. But whether he takes you from it or joins you in it, you have an encounter with the living God because you're supposed to be all shook up, all tied up, all screaming and hollering and worried and depressed. And here you are walking around the fire. Here you are strutting around the fire. Here you are running around the fire. They messing with you at work and you still walking. They criticizing you at work and you still praising. They making it hard for you and you still getting it on. Why? Because you know you're not by yourself. Because sometimes he wants you to see what it's like when you're in the fire with the Lord. Why? Why, God? Why are you going to do this? Look, I need to walk with you. I need to walk with you. Walk, walk with me. I want you to turn to 1 Peter. I want to walk you through a series of scriptures. I want to walk you through a series. Of, you need to know these scriptures in 1 Peter to show you this is not just New Te Old Testament. This is New Testament. He says in 1 Peter a number of scriptures that will change your bad situation at work, change your bad situation at the company when you have this kind of understanding of a bad suffering season in your life. He says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse harshly treated, you endure it with patience, but if when you do what is right and suffer, for if you patiently endure, this finds favor with God. So if you're doing right and taking your stand, you're making God happy and you're finding favor with God even though you're suffering. Look at chapter 3, verse 14. He says, but even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed and do not fear their intimidation. I don't care who they are or what their title is. Don't be scared of their intimidation and do not be troubled just because they talk and smack and talk and noise if you're suffering for righteousness. Verse 17 For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than doing what is wrong. Finally he says in chapter 5 verse 10 After you have suffered for a little while the God of all grace who called you by his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you to him be the dominion. He gonna call the final shot. He gonna say where this job situation works out, whether there or somebody else. Because remember, your job, your government is only your resource. It is not your source. Some of you remember my story when I was in seminary working at Trailways. I was loading and loading buses. They came to me because they had a scam. The scam was when people went out for lunch then somebody else would punch them in after an hour even though they may stay out three or four hours and hadn't been punched in. And so you rotated and somebody did that for you you did that for somebody else. They came and said to me well here's the deal this is how you do it. This is your day to punch somebody else in after an hour even though they'll be gone three hours and then somebody will do that for you. In other words rob the company of time and money and, and, and what's going on. So I told him, I said, I, I can't do that because as a Christian, that, that, that's stealing and, and that's not something I can do. And they said, oh no, you don't understand. Everybody does it. It's the way we roll up in here. So you got, you got to expect, you can't be an exception. Everybody does it. Let's, let's get over this Christian stuff and, and this is how we do it in the company. I said, I'm so sorry. Respectfully, you know, I, I can't do that. Well, they said, well, since you can't do that, you're going to be unloading a lot of these buses by yourself. 
When the buses came in, I wound up having to unload a lot of them by myself because they wouldn't help me because I didn't conform to what they were asking me to do that was clearly unbiblical with the company. This went on for weeks and weeks and weeks. I'm discouraged, I'm depressed, I'm frustrated because uh, this has been thrown on me and I have that same attitude that we all have sometimes. God, why, why are you letting this happen to me when I'm trying to be and was to come to the to the uh, owner's office or the, the manager's office for trailways. I went in the manager's office. He said to me, we've been having a night supervisor come around at night to see what was going on with the night shift. We are very aware of this, this scheme that they're doing of punching people in when they really haven't come back. We're also aware that you were not a participant. So what we would like to do is make you manager of the whole ship. Now, I didn't know somebody was watching. I didn't know there was a fourth person in the fire. I didn't know that something else was going on. But you have to understand that when God decides to promote you, it doesn't matter what men say to you. So it's time for us to take a stand. A man was on an island one day, and he got, he got shipwrecked on this island, and nobody was there. He was out there by himself, and he wondered, well, how was he going to survive on this island? He put some sticks together to make a little hut to keep him away from the inclement weather, and he got in that hut. But through a series of events, the hut caught on fire. So the hut is on fire. He's on this isolated island. A few days later, a boat comes to deliver him from the island. He said, well, how did you know I was on the island? Oh, they said it was simple. We saw you the smoke signals you were sending up to let us know you were here. Sometimes God lets you catch fire, but it's really a smoke signal saying to God, God, here's where I am. And even though I'm in a fire, I know you know where I'm located. So I want you to go back to work tomorrow and serve the Lord Christ. I want you to go back to work tomorrow and be a Christian on your job. Serving with excellence, serving the Lord, but knowing the Lord knows where you're sitting. He knows how long he wants you there. He knows when it's time to move, and he knows the bills that you have to pay. And says he is your source, and everything else is your resource. You can lift your head up high, and even if the rest of the folk don't like you on the job, you just find you a Meshach, a Shadrach, and an Abednego, and you take your stand for God, because God ultimately owns the company. Let's give him some praise in the midst of your problems. Divine encounters often happens in the midst of struggle. And that's when God wants to give us an encounter to change us. For example, Jacob was a trickster. He lived his life through uh, conniving, tricking people, and it caught up with him, just like our character flaws catch up with us. But even then, in our mess, God performs miracles. He creates a struggle, and God is right in the midst of the struggle because the angel of God came and wrestled with Jacob all night long until he got his name changed. The changing of names in the Bible is a shifting of character. He went from uh, this trickster to a person whom God helped. But something had to get dislocated first. God dislocated his hip because he had to walk with the limp as a perpetual reminder that he wrestled with God. And God will wrestle with us until he changes us. And sometimes he leaves some things behind and remind us not to go back the old character that was damaging before. But that's good news in a painful situation. If you're struggling right now because something needs to change in your life or mine, God is loving you and me enough to take us through the struggle. And he will keep the struggle there until we get the message that character flaws need to be changed because he wants to conform us to the image of Jesus. So rather than getting mad at the struggle or the limp, I want you to praise God that he loved you enough to put you in the struggle in order to change your character. Because once he changed Jacob's character, he became useful, he became productive, and he is found in the New Testament as a hero and not as a failure. So your yesterday character flaws don't have to be your tomorrow's definition. 
because once God gives you an encounter of struggle that changes you, then he can use you for his glory, the advancement of his kingdom, and the improvement of the lives and in the lives of others.